I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the new Yankee workshop. How about a blanket chest built from pine and lined with aromatic cedar? Welcome to Nantucket, a beautiful island about 30 miles out to sea off the coast of Massachusetts. And today I'm here to show you one of my favorite houses, this one right here. They say it was built in 1790 in downtown Nantucket, which is about two miles in that direction. And then in 1846, they moved it to this location by bringing it over the ice of the frozen harbor. It's one of those houses that's filled with antiques, much like the ones that I'm trying to build at the new Yankee workshop. There's a few pieces I want to show you inside. Come on. One thing this house has no shortage of is chest. Here's a nice one right here. Wide pine boards and beautifully dovetailed down along the corner, all hand done. And over here is even a better one. Talk about craftsmanship. Very fine dovetailing. Beautifully done. Well, to build our blanket chest today, I only need a few special materials. One of them is this hinge, which I picked up at the local hardware store. It's a piano hinge, three feet long, brass plated. Then the next thing that I need is some cedar, aromatic cedar. And I got this down at the lumber yard. Smells great. And they claim it'll keep the insects and bugs from eating all the clothes and blankets we're going to put in this chest. And then, of course, the more basic material is this 1 by 12 pine. I like to use the 12-inch width because it gives me the least amount of waste and the most flexibility to cut my pieces. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is cut the rough links. And I have a list of all the pieces that I need. And I'll cut each piece one or two inches longer than what I really need. The reason for that is, is I don't want to commit to final length now. I want to have some extra wood to square them up a little bit later on. So the first piece I'm going to cut is for our legs, and they should be about 22 inches long. For this ripping part of the operation, I like to use my table saw. And more importantly, I make sure that I have a very sharp, fine-tooth carbide tip blade so that I end up with the smoothest possible cuts that I can get. Now, with all my pieces of stock ripped to the correct width, I'm now ready to go to squaring up and cutting to the exact length. And to do that, I'm going to use this power miter box. And this one has a little added feature, which are these extensions running on each side. Now, the one here on the left side also has a fancy tape rule built into it. And it has this adjustable stop. And I know that when I set my cross here, in this case, I want to set it at 21 and a quarter inches, I know that that's the precise distance between this stop and the side of the blade. So now I'm ready to cut my pieces. Now, I don't want to just put it in there and cut it. First thing I want to do is square it, because I'm not sure whether this edge is perfectly square. So I'll just take off a little bit. Then I slide it down against my stop and make the cut. OK, that takes care of all the pieces that I have to cut to exact length. These are the corner styles, the long rails, the short rails, and the cleats to support the bottom. Now I'm ready to glue up the top. Now notice for my top, I'm using four boards rather than one or two wide ones. And I do that so that I have more stability and a much stronger top. And when I do the glue up, I pay attention to the growth rings. Here, they're curving up. Here, they're down. Here, they're up. And here, they're down. And that will add to more stability and make the top less likely to warp. Also notice that very little glue has been squeezed out. Clamp with just enough pressure to hold the boards together. Believe me, I've learned the hard way. If you put too much pressure, it might fall apart. So now I think we'll set this aside, and then we're ready for some grooving and mortising. Now there's the groove, 
And our two corner styles, which in fact make the legs for the blanket chest, fit together like this. Now the groove is just cut with a router, mounted underneath a router table, and a nice long fence with a 3 8 inch grooving bit. Now to cut the tongue, which is in the other piece, which will actually join the corner together, I'm going to use the table saw. And I've set the blade so that I end up with a 3 8 inch tongue, and it's set at about 3 16 inch depth. Now to set up for the rest of the removal of material for the tongue, I'm going to use the grooved piece as a guide, and I want the edge of the blade to line up with the edge of my groove. Now for the depth, I want to raise the blade up so that it's about 3 eighths of an inch high. That fits pretty good. Now let's set the legs up as they will be when the chest is all put together. Okay. Now with all my legs set up in the position that they're going to be when the cabinet is built, I can see that the front pieces are the full width legs and the side pieces will have the joints in it. Generally you want to have the full pieces towards the front. Now this mortise that I just cut is the one that will be used to connect the rails together. And with all the legs in the right position, you want to label the top of each piece for that mortise because there is a front and a back, there is a top and a bottom, and you don't want to end up cutting a mortise down on the bottom of the leg. Now for that mortise, I just used the three and a half, the three eighths inch bit as we had in the grooving operation, except that I've added this stop, which will give me a three and a half inch mortise. Okay, now I'm ready to do the other three legs. Okay, now the mortise I've just cut down here is used to connect the bottom rails together. And to cut that, I use the same router setup with a stop lock in a new position and a reference line to plunge down into the router bit. Let me show you. Okay, so I end up with a three inch mortise that's four inches up from the bottom of the leg. Now I'm ready to do the other three legs. Now to join my rails to my legs, I need to make tenons in all the rails. And to do that, the first thing I do is clamp a block of wood to my rip fence. And that'll act as a gauge for the shoulder cut, which is the one that runs right along here. It also allows me to use my T-square in combination with the rip fence and not get any binding or kickback. So now the thing that I have to do is run all my rails through both ends. Okay, now the next thing I have to do is make my shoulder cuts on the edges. And I'll do that to both the top edge and the bottom edge of all the bottom rails, but just the bottom edge of the top rails. Now the next thing that I want to do is remove the rest of this material. And for that I don't need this guide anymore and I don't need my T-square. What I'll do is take one of our legs and using the mortise groove that you can see, line up my blade for removing the rest of that material. Right about there. And for the depth, I'll just use this sample tenon and lower it down. And in fact, it's about 3 eighths of an inch high. 
And now we'll just run all the pieces through. Now I've removed my regular table saw blade and installed this adjustable dado head. And I've set it up so that it'll remove about a quarter of an inch in width. And it's also set up to be right in the center of a piece of three quarter inch stock. The cut will be three eighths of an inch deep. And I need to make that cut on every one of these rails so that later it'll accept my panels. Okay, now the next thing that I have to do is take our legs and run a groove between the two mortises so that it'll accept our panels. But I don't want to run beyond this bottom mortise, so I've installed a piece of tape here which will tell me where to stop so that won't happen. Now there's one more thing I want to do before I take the dado head off. But first I'm going to take a piece of tape and put it right on the table here. And what that'll indicate is a point that's about a quarter of an inch back from where the blade starts cutting. And I'm going to take these two pieces here and run a groove all the way up, stopping about a quarter of an inch from the edge. And that'll be our pieces for our top. The next thing I want to do to these leg parts is cut this arc in the bottom of each piece, one on the front and one on the side. And I'll use this piece as a pattern to do my layout, and I think I'll cut them over on the bandsaw. Well, I suppose I could have cut these with my saber saw, and I could have cut them one at a time, but I like to put them in pairs because it just makes the operation go faster. Now you begin to see what the front and sides of our blanket chest are going to look like. Now this happens to be a front, and there's one more piece I have to make, and it's this center style. I have to put a tongue in each end so that it'll fit in this groove that we've made for the panels. And I'll do that over here on the table saw. Now with my center style in place, I'm ready to start working on my panels. And I'm going to build those out of solid three-quarter inch stock. But I want to make the panels three-sixteenths of an inch bigger than this opening on all four sides. And to cut them, I'll just use my stationary saw. Okay, that takes care of the ripping and cross-cutting of our panels. Now I want to put a rabbit in them. So I have to readjust my fence so that I'm over a quarter of an inch to the outside of the blade. And I want to reset the height to about a half an inch. And I don't need my T-square anymore and I'll run the panels through on the flat. Okay, to remove the rest of this material right here, I'm going to reset the fence. And now I want to have a quarter of an inch about a quarter of an inch or a little less between the blade and the fence. 
and I want to lower it so that it's about a quarter of an inch above the table. Lower the blade so it's a quarter of an inch above the table. All right, with all my rabbiting done, you can see that when it's assembled, I'm going to end up with a nice recessed panel here. But on the inside, because I'm using full thickness stock for strength, I'm going to have this sharp edge, and I want to knock that corner off on the table saw. This is going together quite well. Everything's fitting fine. And you know, when we glue this up, we just put glue on these styles and rails on the tenons. We don't want to get glue on the panels. We don't want to put glue in the grooves for the panels because if we did that, the expansion and contraction of the panel might cause it to split. So that just kind of floats in the frame itself. So a good liberal coat of glue here, and then we just put it together and clamp it. Just enough pressure so the glue starts to squeeze out. Okay, you notice that I've done an additional thing to the back here, and this is really optional. I took this rear style, the top style, and I ripped it on the table saw so that it reduced the width here by about an eighth of an inch. And that gives me a little recess for this piano hinge to sit in, and that'll allow the top to close nice and flat. Well, with all this gluing done, I guess we're ready to start continuing some work on our top. At this point, I've calculated that my top should be cut to 39 and 3 quarter inches. Now this panel cutter that I use to square up the top is a real handy device. It's just a big T-square piece of plywood with a stop on the front of it. And underneath, we have a spline that just runs in the standard groove of the saw. Now, with the cross-cutting and squaring done, I'm ready to rip. And I've already set my fence at 19 inches. Now, in order to put this breadboard on the edge of our top, I need to make a tongue for this groove. And to do that, I'm just using my handheld router with a rabbiting bit. And this little ball bearing here rides on the wood so that just the right amount of material is taken out. Watch. OK, here's a little detail you remember. We want to cut off a little bit of this tongue. And the reason is for that is because when we made the breadboard edge, we stopped a little bit short so the tongue won't show through the end. And now it'll just fit on like this. Now we're ready to glue it up. Again, all you need is just a little pressure with these clamps just to hold everything together while the glue sets up. I'm going to put this on the side, and I think it's time we get back to the side pieces and they can be unclamped. And this is the time, and actually there's no better time than now to sand the inside of our blanket chest. And to do that, I'm just going to use my standard palm sander. And that'll remove any of the marks and even up all the joinery so that it'll be perfect. Now this little cleat that I'm installing at the lower edge of the inside panel will support the bottom of our blanket chest. Oh, a little more glue and some clamps. And as you can see, this chest is really starting to come together. It's not a bad idea to check it for square at this point. And if the two diagonal measurements are exactly the same as they are in this one. It's perfectly square. Hey, a little bit of glue on our cleats. Piece of half inch plywood. Nice cut, nice and square for the bottom. Half inch plywood. We'll 
fasten it down with a few screws, and well, then we'll line it with some cedar. I'm using my miter box to cut all my pieces of cedar. And you notice the manufacturer has grooved and tongued all four edges of this material. So it's real easy to install. And really, you only have to cut one piece in each row of cedar we're going to put here in the bottom of the chest. Now, to hold it in place, I'm just using a construction or panel adhesive. And I'll run a bead along the edge and then some shorter beads out. And just simply set our cedar right into it. That takes care of the bottom. Now I guess we're ready to finish the top. Well, that's not too bad. Nice and solid. Got some good weight to it. And this piano hinge works very nicely. And I can smell that cedar from way up here. Now all I gotta do is figure out how I wanna finish it. So well, first, a coat of sanding sealer on the entire chest, inside and out, except for the aromatic cedar because I don't wanna seal out that great fragrance. Okay, with that sanding sealer dried and lightly sanded, I have the perfect base to start my finishes. The sanding sealer sort of fills any voids or imperfections in the wood, and when it's sanded, I have a nice smooth surface for that first coat of finish. And in this case, it's gonna be a satin polyurethane. And now for the second and final coat of polyurethane. And this will give me a nice, durable finish. And you know, the thing that's really nice about it is that unlike the old varnishes, the urethanes don't yellow. So I'm going to be able to appreciate the natural beauty of this pine for many years.